Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, in addition to having a day job for Bloomberg Intelligence and co-hosting Trillions with me, you also have another side of your career, which I hope comes up in all your reviews, which is the TV show on Bloomberg TV called ETFIQ. Yeah, which so, began about the same time as Trillions, actually, I think. It did. There was a first iteration, like pre-COVID, with Scarlett Fu, who we did a show with her, um, I think maybe a year and a half in. And then it shut down. It went dark for like a year and a half. They shut all the half an hour shows down that were specialty. They slowly started them back up after we came back to the office. And so when they were looking to redo it, there was some shifts in personnel. And so they made a new iteration of ETFIQ with Matt Miller, Katie Greifeld, and myself. And I'm Matt and Katie are are sort of like the main anchors. I'm sort of like the weatherman or the commentary guy. I do some special work um, at the beginning of a couple segments and sort of provide, I ask a few questions, but I see myself more like a specialist and they're sort of um, more generalist. And I think it's a good combo. And the show's every um, Monday at 1 p.m. It's a half an hour. Live. Goes by fast. Live. Live. Yeah. Live TV is interesting. I mean, unlike this where I can mess up and we can edit out, you, you have to just roll through. And keep talking. Special shout out to Magnus Hendrickson, who's our producer and has been our producer yes. of Trillions for a while. We kept him busy with this episode because there's a fair <laughs> amount of editing. Thanks, Magnus. And I just want to, speaking of shout outs, uh, obviously, the three of us are on the air. We bring on guests, but the behind the scenes, the other people who are, you know, spend a lot of their time working on the show, Tim Andreacci, um, Ritika Gupta, uh, Maureen Lawler, Kieran Buchanan, and Alex Soto. And then sometimes we'll have, uh, if some one of us is out, like a Shanali Basic will fill in or a Kaylee Lines. Um, so it's a show where a lot of people work on it um, every week. And I'm sure they do many other things. This is just one part of their job. It's only a half an hour show. But we do our best to put in you know, good guests, good topics, and also a little bit of impro- improvisation. We don't over-prepare. I think in the first iteration of the show, I found myself really over-preparing. I, I wrote the whole script out. I think we did that this podcast. We would over-script at the beginning. Now I've learned to trust my instincts and a little have more improv and let it feel a little more organic. And I think we've, we've done a good job at that, I think. Okay, so what are we going to hear today on Trillions? So we're going to bring on Matt Miller and Katie. And I've basically teed up about six clips that I think sort of represent some topics and guests uh, about the show. And also some of the quirks of, of Katie and Matt that I think come across. And, you know, we're just sort of like some of the highlights basically from the first year. Some big names in here. Yeah. You know, we get some big names. And then I also think we get names that are big names later. Like, um, I remember we had Kathy Wood. Before the run of, of all of Kathy Wood's ETFs, yeah. Totally. I mean, I used to, when I, we first had ETF IQ, I would try to promote it internally is that this show's really not just about ETFs, it's tomorrow's stars today. Sort of like MTV's 190 minutes or 120 minutes where you'd go and watch Sunday night at like, you know, 11 p.m. and you'd see like, you'd see like Nirvana before they went mainstream. I feel as though we're, we're, get, we're early because a lot of ETF issuers who put out ETFs, get some assets, that's where the money's going. And these people are going to be the stars of tomorrow in a lot of cases. But we still will always sometimes get a current star. But Kathy's case, I think she's a star who was on the ETF show early. Perth Toll's another one. There are definitely some people we get early and they become, they branch out. Then, they, then you see them all over Bloomberg TV and all the shows. Okay, joining us on this episode, we've got Matt Miller of Bloomberg TV along with Katie Greifeld, who's a, a regular on Trillions and a reporter with Bloomberg News. This time on Trillions, highlights of year one from ETF IQ. Katie, Matt, welcome back to Trillions. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. It's my first time, actually. Oh, I have been here many times. Oh, you're lucky. Yeah. Long overdue. Yeah. I've been a long time listener, so thank you. For Great to have you, you as a first time caller. Uh, Eric, how, how do you want to do this? I pulled five or six clips that I think were kind of highlights of the year. Might get uh, Katie and Matt talking. So uh, uh, we can start with the first one if you want. Okay, here we go. So the first clip is from the very first guest on the very first show. Can you guys remember who that was? Holly Framstad. Yes. <laughs> so here she is talking about active ETFs, which has become a huge issue for us and a theme in the show. Where we look at our core investor base, you know, there are trillions of dollars of assets still in actively managed solutions that haven't moved to index. So I think what, the, what that tells me is there's a clear space for active in ETFs at the core. And that is squarely where we think our investors and our clients will use our products. She was not wrong, right? I'd say if there's one ETF that we've talked about 
the most, other than Spy, mm -hmm. all year long, it's been Jeppy. Am I wrong about that? Jeppy, definitely. Because yeah. it took in so much money since it's like the new arc in terms of flows. Can I just toot our own horns for a little bit? The fact that we had Capital Group on, like immediately after they launched their first ETFs, and the fact that we were focused on active, I mean, to Matt's point, we've been talking about it for a year straight. And I mean, Holly really put it very well that you have trillions of dollars in active funds that haven't made their way to ETFs yet. And that's exactly what we've seen over the past year. It was prescient for sure. I thought um, active now takes in like 30, 40 percent of the flows and they make up 4 percent of the assets. Huge for huge now. Story. Yeah, I was going to say, does that continue? Do you think that continues? Yeah, because there's still so many trillions in active mutual funds. A lot of it's just the migration over. It's not new money. That's the a little bit of the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody's waking up, oh, give me active. I think a lot of it's people who were in active mutual funds like the ETF wrapper better. You know, the other thing I just want to say, we're going to have a little, this can be a little bit of a rivalry here. We've got two sides of Eric here, the ETF IQ uh, side and the Which show do you side. like more? Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, are our are you show- kidding me? I'm not going to answer that. To be fair, our show is shorter and we are shallower. Yeah. Straight. True. We don't get yeah. as deep we're as you do. We're extremely shallow people. But there, there's something about live TV that just gets the blood flow and there's something special if about it. If you love adrenaline, yeah. you love live television. But you can't, you definitely can't go as deep. Yeah. Uh, here you can also make mistakes here and like just edit it out. Like you just basically have to move on on TV. Mm -hmm. Like you know, employ Magnus as our producer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clip two. Okay, clip two is this is Matt. This is a, this first C block guest where we drill down into an ETF. This do you, you know who that was, Katie? Will Hershey. Yeah. Wow. Photographic memory over here. Okay. That Will, was like a big deal I, for I know me. Will. I had a photographic memory 20 years ago, you know? <laughs> so Will Hershey was talking about Met V. And this is a great clip because sometimes on the show, I'll kind of chat with Matt ahead of time before the, the we go to air, and I'll just give him some, like, inside baseball, and he'll go right on air with it. <laughs> so I told him about the Met V ticker sale to uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and, and, and Will did not want this brought up. So go ahead. You know what, let me soften you up with a few questions first and then hit you with the hard one. But I'll just go ahead and ask. Um, you sold the ticker, Meta, to Mark Zuckerberg. I guess he called you up and said, Will, you know, I'll give you like a, your own Caribbean island. What did you get for that? You know, I'm, I'm actually probably going to plead the fifth on that one. What I will say is changing from Meta to Met V, I think, eliminated some of the confusion in the market. When Facebook changed their name to Meta, that was truly a validation of the theme for us. And we're seeing investors play with their money. Way to soft them on up there. I was going to, but I felt like, you know, we only have a half hour. And if you take out commercial breaks, it's more like 22 minutes. Yeah. So why beat around the bush? Yeah, right, right, right to the jugular. Exactly. So he got his own G550 now uh, or G650. Something is, like that. He got his own private jet um, for selling Mark Zuckerberg the meta ticker. And what's great about that is he had his own canned answer. and But Matt put so much of what people are really thinking in the question that everything is out there now. Because you knew Will wasn't going to really do mm. much with that. He said his little thing and then and wanted it to go away. I remember after that happened, when it was announced they were actually changing the ticker, so many people asked me for a number. Oh, how much did he get? We never quite got it out of him. Do you know? Eric, I think Eric knows. There were rumors. I, I there think were rumors. 20, 25 million? I don't know. If That's what should. I thought as well. I heard 25 million. You can buy an island with that, right? Somewhere. I think you can buy a jet with that. Um, and then you can just go to whichever island you You'd feel like at that moment. You'd have to have multiple bank accounts. He's still working though. Like so, True. I don't know. If I got twenty five million, I might just leave the industry. With, with the two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar FDIC insurance limit, you'd have to open a ton of oh, bank yeah. accounts. <laughs> it still just makes me astounded that Mark Zuckerberg was willing to change his name, name of the company to, to Meta. Like it, it, it was it, a big step. He it was, was so crazy and bold. Um, and, you know, we'll see how that mistake. Maybe a decade early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, well, who am I? It was like everybody's going to say re return to office now. Stop doing this thing yeah. called the metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to be a little bit ironic if Meta, if Meta orders everyone back to the office and they're like, they why? They they can just we live in the metaverse. I'm supposed yeah. to be in the Horizonville with a torso. Yeah. Um, all of us could be doing this right now. Someone said, what was, torsos. someone asked me, what was the bigger mistake 
uh, Mark Zuckerberg changing the whole company and betting on Metaverse or Tom Brady coming back to play another oh. year with the Bucks and kind of like ruining his marriage? It, to Zuck's credit, he changed the conversation. He did not like the one that they were having about his company. And mm-hmm. he Absolutely. Said, he, he created a whole new... I think Tom Brady is the universe. bigger it was L. Trumpish, very Trumpish yeah. of him. Yeah. And uh, Brady hasn't quite learned that lesson yet. But the ETF side of this was from the moment that it happened, we were like, that's, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. Uh, so good on you for asking it, about it, Matt. Okay, number three. Uh, sometimes it's a big get, name. Yeah, we get some big names sometimes. Kathy Wood, who um, you know has had a rough year, but she's always interesting. She's just good TV because she says a lot. Of, she's just the, the people who are at the top of the companies are always the best interviews because they don't really they're not in the middle. They don't really care what their bosses think because they are the boss, right? So Kathy is very open. We asked her about. She says her funds are inherently ESG. That's a huge theme on the show. And we asked her whether she agrees with Elon that ESG is an outrageous scam. Sort of an interesting wedge question. That characterization of ESG, what I've always said when people have asked us about our um, our portfolios, I've always said they are intrinsically um, good for the environment, socially good, and uh, you know we we have a scoring system around governance. So we certainly uh, we certainly are focused on doing the right thing, which is what I think. Uh, ESG is all about. I think it got way out of hand. And there was a lot of slapping lipstick on a pig and, Mm. you know, basically any portfolio being kind of uh, promoted as ESG. All right. Well, to some extent, she was right. She was kind of proved out or Elon Musk, I should say, was right by MSCI's recent move, right? Yeah. I've always been bullish ESG metrics. If you're analyzing a company or an active manager, why not get more data that's going to be a huge area. Packaging it into a fund and like making your, you know, banking your retirement on it, your mm-hmm. kid's education, I'm always skeptical of that. I, and it's trying to make something that's subjective, objective. And it's very difficult to do that. So ESG funds bearish, ESG metrics bullish for me. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a broad umbrella. Someone's going to be upset. But ESG is, I think, probably come up on every show, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we ESG just keep active. talking about it. <laughs> Most every show. But the thing, the thing is, I think people invested on principles long before ESG was around. But you're very smart to point out that it's subjective, right? And what the taxonomy is trying to do is turn it into an objective thing. And I think they've failed pretty miserably, at least thus far. Speaking of which. Speaking Don't we get your which, take on any of these things, Joel? <laughs> I have no takes for this one. This is all, this is you guys. Well, I do think we talked about ESG a lot on trillions. I think you're, the way you just described it, Eric, I think is interesting because I don't think that's come through the in, in the trillion segments that we've done, that the metrics you're interested in and, and that you're, you're pro data, just not maybe more acronyms. marketing. Yeah, because and marketing. E- an yeah. ESG ETF inherently wants to take over your core. Because why would you put 5% into an ESG fund? Because then you're still on SPY, which has all the bad stocks, right? Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to go all in if you're going to be ESG. And that's, I don't know, that's that's basically betting all your money on a more expensive active approach, which, again, you can underperform. And that's what people saw in the past 18 months. That's, I've just been bearish on that. Yeah. Everything else I kind of get. So interesting way to articulate it. Okay, so good transition here, because this next guest made a ton of noise in the ETF space, and then he went ahead and like declared himself a presidential uh, potential. Yeah, this is Vivek Ramswamy, who uh, started Strive. And as we interviewed him over, we had him on Trillions, we had him on the show, you could see he was just getting himself into this political sort of communication. And I'm not surprised it just evolved to him going, you know what, screw it, ETFs aren't enough, I'm running for president. So His signs were there. <laughs> just, yeah. you know, logical transition. It but could have been the if, end game from the beginning. <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> well, but Nate, Nate Trace and I were talking about how, like, this is like ETF marketing to a whole nother level. Because he's going to be able to maybe, like, because his ETFs match what he's saying on the presidential trail. Anyway, Matt um, had a really cool setup for a question to Vivek. And Vivek, I got to say, is a very good communicator, regardless if you agree or not. Your focus, Vivek, on on making money, right? This is what investors want to do. I think of it like uh, Michael Jordan in that great documentary said, I just didn't want to focus on politics. I was focused on winning basketball games. There are athletes who focus on politics and they don't necessarily put up as many points on the board as those um, who focus on what they're doing, what what they're there for. And and that's what you want to really um, bring out here. You want to sort of rebirth capitalism into the investment space. 
Exactly. And starting with the U.S. energy sector, picking the one sector that I think has been most economically damaged by these politicized demands coming from large capital owners and shareholders. And so our message is really simple. If you're an oil company, be a great oil company. If you're a natural gas company, be a great natural gas company. And if you're an alternative energy company, be a great alternative energy company. But don't mandate oil companies to stop being oil companies, which is what the likes of BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard have done. Now, I will say Matt didn't exactly ask a question there. I, I didn't mean to sell his ETF <laughs> yeah. for him. Re-listening to that, I wish I could shorten that intro yeah. because... And and, and end, end your statement with a question instead of a statement. I was statement. also comparing him to Jordan. I don't yeah. know that that yeah. was <laughs> the yeah. right look. Well, it lives on in trillions forever now. Well, I, I recently watched Last Dance again with my 12-year-old, and I noticed that Jordan had to account for that whole Republicans buy sneakers too. And that's sort of what he said. He's like, I'm just busy playing basketball. I just didn't really want to get into that arena. Uh, so I think that's what your question was focused on. But he, because he, he was trying to defend that he wasn't anti ESG. He was he, just yeah, pro exactly. capitalism. I mean, we we called it the anti woke ETF, and he didn't like that, yeah. or at least he didn't want us to frame it that way, or at least he wanted to push back against framing it that way. Um, I think though that he misses an important point, which is that sometimes companies need to pivot. I mean, sometimes you're an mm-hmm. oil producer and then you realize you should be a battery maker. Maybe that's too much of a pivot, but you get my point, right? And his uh, theory um, or his investment strategy doesn't really allow for that. Well, it- I think his point, like if you think we had him on around the launch of the Strive U.S. Energy ETF, which tracks iShares is energy. ETF. And his whole point was these companies need to drill more and frack more, basically making the point that they're not, it's not that they're pivoting, which to your point, some companies need to do. It's just they're straying away from what they're supposed to do and not even channeling that energy into something productive. He's concerned about the regulation, but sometimes these companies decide not to drill more and frack more because it's not economically expedient to do so, right? If they see a downturn coming, if they see a drop in demand, they're naturally Mm going to pull back on investment. So there's a difference between making the right decision for your shareholders and being forced to do something by regulators. But this taps into this ETF doesn't have hardly any assets like VTI alone takes in more than their whole company every day. But VTI, what, do, what can you say? It's the total market. So this t- also talks about with TV, some things play well that tap into debates and conversations that don't have a lot of assets like ESG mm-hmm. versus Vanguard. You know, we cover Vanguard to a degree, but asset wise, we should cover them for a third of the show. But we don't. Yeah. We give more time to some of this other stuff that's new or innovative or debatable. By the way, don't Vivex ETFs um, mimic existing uh, gigantic products that are already in the market, except for they have a much higher expense ratio. So Strive wants to charge a lot more money for something that's very similar to something that Vanguard gives away for free. Close, but this, the fees are the same. But they're, they're, ah. yeah, the fees are the same to his credit. And then they just say, we're going to we'll erase that part. Magnus, yeah. erase that part. <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> also, also okay. probably a better ticker. Um, but yeah, speaks to, uh, there, there's some interesting takeaways in that one. Okay. <laughs> Next. Yeah, next we have Nate Geraci, who's a friend of the show, a fr- you know, a great guy. He was on, and we have advisors on, the A Block. These are people who invest and actually put money to work. That's what our A Block's about. He talks about a $1 trillion prediction, and this also, Katie's reaction to his answer. <laughs> Katie's got the best reactions, and she cracks me up constantly, and I think this clip uh, sort of shows that. Because the first U.S.-listed ETF, the Spider S&P 500 ETF, turns 30 years old next month. And from my perspective, it's pretty remarkable that ETFs have now been around for three decades, yet the industry is still accelerating, still growing, which gets to my first prediction, which is that I believe ETF inflows will surpass 1 trillion in 2023. So we knocked on the door in 2021, had over 900 billion of inflows. 2022, as we just discussed, highly impressive, just given the markets, around 600 billion in inflows. I think 2023 will be the year that we eclipse 1 trillion in inflows for the first time. I just think the ETF industry is firing on all cylinders right now, and uh, ETFs are the investment vehicle moving forward. Eric, did you know that Spy and I are the same age? (laughs) <laughs> we have almost the same birthday. I was born in May. That is really cool. That's a great fun fact <laughs> for the last show. <laughs> it's not I, my birthday yet, but very soon. May, May 18th. May 18th, May 18th yes. is Katie's birthday. That stuff really makes financial television work. Because mm-hmm. a lot of it's scripted. The people are scripted. They're on message points. 
I think when I watch, I like to see the coloring out of the lines to a degree uh, in between some of the guests. I, so I like that. You're good at coloring outside the lines, Katie. Well, this is why I was so thrilled to be a part of this next generation of ETFIQ, because I knew I was going to be with Eric, who I get along with famously. I knew I was going to be with Matt Miller, who... It's hard to script you, Matt. It's hard to keep you in the box. So it's been... well, Matt. So Matt doesn't go to many of the prep meetings, but I think that's a that's a feature, not a bug, because we kind of like overdo it. We think yeah. it. We're cooking and cooking. Somebody can overcook. He comes in and sort of just keeps it fresh, alive. Um, he might just ask something from the news flow from another show he was on because he's on radio all like since like four yeah, in the morning. Yeah, to be fair, I don't go to the prep meetings because you hold them while I'm on a live <laughs> international broadcast. For sure, for sure, that's true. I but think it works. I think the dynamic it does work, works. Yeah, because also you have to assume that people who are perhaps watching at one p.m. on television, maybe they're not so in the weeds as we are. So Matt brings. It that is to- a lot of fun though because you guys are the insiders, right? I mean, Katie's uh, reporting on this for BN all day. You run this Trillions podcast with Joel, so you guys live in the ETF world. You go to the conference in Miami. We have right? a great to time. To be clear, I try and stay outside of that world. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. No, well, Matt and Joel are the like the. <laughs> The Jim Nances of this, right? We're the Tony Romos, right? Yeah, they're the, they're I like, get that let's, reference. Let's come out of the weeds here and keep. Let's break this down. Keep it simple. I think Tony Romo is the one that makes the money. But um, <laughs> okay, how do we feel about this one trillion dollar prediction now? It's probably not going to happen. They've taken seventy five billion in the first quarter. Uh, oh, is that it, for overall ETF flows? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Feel, feels like that's not going to happen. Probably not. Um, but. I think o- over time, I'm just very bullish on the industry, but a trillion this year, probably not going to happen. But who knows? Okay, we got another one. So A block macro, C block ETF. B block is where we bring on like uh, a BI analyst like Ethan or James or a BN person like Sam Potter or um, Phil Donna. And in this case, we're going to look at Sam Potter, uh, who talked about bond mutual funds to ETFs. And he's a, one of our favorite guests. Bloomberg News Editor, Sam Potter. Um, but what's been going on under the surface is this uh, this shift between bond mutual funds to ETFs. Now, we know that bond ETFs have really come of age these last couple of years, especially after the, the pandemic and the Fed stepping in to back bond ETFs. Um, but what's different this year is this sort of consistent outflows from bond mutual funds. We're now at something like $450 billion dollars have left bond mutual funds in the uh, the past year or so. At the same time, about 150 billion going into ETFs. It sounds so much better coming from Sam Potter. I was going to say he's even good looking yeah. just on audio. <laughs> so <laughs> Matt got there before I was going to even bring it up. I love having Sam Potter on because he's my ETF editor, etc. You know, fantastic person to work with. But also every time he's on, Matt invariably says in the chat, "This man is so handsome." Well, it's not my fault. I mean, he's objectively an attractive man. Uh, he is. I don't know what to say else about that. He's got a than- little of the Hugh Grant thing, and then his voice is just sound. You know, he's got. He's got. A, he's, he's definitely um, got something. Okay, wait. Well, the let's words. Talk, are, let's talk about are the so sub- Let's talk about the substance of his words, <laughs> Katie. Anything you want to say about bond mutual the funds? The words are also really good that come out of his mouth. And I mean, what he was talking about there, that trend that we were talking about for months, every single show, the fact that bond ETFs were taking in billions and billions and at the same time, bond mutual funds are absolutely bleeding. That was one of the big themes of 2022. And continues to be a theme of 2023, right? I mean, that's going to go on until what mutual funds are all bled out. No, I think uh, they won't all bleed out. They got the 401k plans. But why not? As long as you get- 401k plans. Okay, but that could change, right? Do you expect regulation to address, you know, ETFs and 401ks ever? The thing with ETFs and 401ks is like, I don't know if you remember Superman 2. Yes, of course. Yeah. When he goes into the booth- With Richard Pryor? No, that's four. Oh, okay. Superman Superman 2. Two? So remember, he wants to marry Lois Lane, but he has to lose his powers in order and be a human to marry Lois Lane. Oh, right. That was sad. So he goes into the box and they strip all his powers away. Feels In hindsight, it feels way too early to to be going down this Superman trajectory. Hear me out. No, it just... ETFs lose... Superman's fault. Like Superman (laughs) 2 should not have gone there this quickly. Yeah. True. True. It was heavy. And that was the one where they had the three villains, remember, who came in the Yeah, the three from Krypton. Yes. Anyway, so they came in that mirror that just spun around all the time <laughs> until it was a great movie. Yeah. So he goes in the box and there's this like thing that goes on. And he loses his powers. ETFs lose their superpowers in a 401k plan. You don't need to trade them in a 401k plan. 
the mutual fund usually get the I class, so it's as cheap as the ETF. And the tax efficiency of the ETF goes away because there's a de- tax deferred. So mutual funds are pretty much on a level playing field. Take them into a taxable account. ETFs usually are going to win that battle. But that's sort of why 401k plans don't have a lot of ETFs. That said, you can still get a, a Vanguard or a Fidelity bond index mutual fund. And you're going to get the same thing as an ETF. So I think passive definitely growing in the 401k. You don't necessarily need the ETF wrapper there. Got it. Okay, and last guest. Last one is somebody we've had a couple times. We had him on when we did the show in Miami, and um, Katie uh, has done a good job booking this guy. It's the deputy CEO of Double Line, Jeff Sherman, uh, who basically works for Jeff Gunlock, who everybody knows. Um, and he's, I think he's good because here he is talking about the Fed, and on our show, we definitely talk about a lot of macro issues. So it's an ETF show, but the macro is important to know where to tweak and shift your ETFs. Um, you know, I want to ask a little bit about uh, Gunlock, your boss. Uh, I've been to several ETF conferences over the past six years, and he's pretty brutal on the Fed. He's been a pretty big critic of the Fed. Um, and I guess now that we're in a different environment, I guess how would you grade the Fed? Uh, do you think here's a, I think a tweet they brought up. This is him at the uh, exchange conference basically saying the Fed should just track the two-year, get rid of 800 economists. <laughs> yeah. PhDs, by the way. That, that's yeah, right, right, that's right. Expensive. Uh, Yeah. So I guess how would you grade the Fed in their dealing with that shock inflation print since then? Yeah. I mean, look, they're doing their job, right? Uh, I mean, we haven't seen kind of a hiking cycle like this. If if they deliver on the 50, it'll be the highest hiking cycle really in the post-World War II era in a calendar year. Um, And so they are being aggressive. And so the grade, I think they're doing a relatively good job, but it's a shock and awe campaign because there's times they waffle a little bit, which gets this risk on trade, the pivots coming. And I think also trade have a short memory. I love talking to Jeff Sherman because he's really an investor. We can have a high level conversation with him, but he also will just explicitly say, I like this type of bonds. I'm not touching junk at this time, things like that. So he really, he gets into it. This, I think, speaks to our program isn't just about ETFs in a vacuum, right? And it wouldn't make sense to talk about them like that anyway. So we bring in every Monday the news of the day and what's going on in markets because that's important to ETF investors as well. And that's why I think Jeff Sherman is one of uh, the great guests to have on this show. I mean, to Katie's point, he, you know, at the end of the day, he needs to make money. Um, Double Line isn't famous because Jeff Gundlach, um, you know, dresses so well. Double Line is famous because they've been killing it. They knocked the ball out of the park over the last decade. They've outperformed everybody else. And that's why it's great to have Jeff Sherman on and, and talk to us about how to actually invest and make money in the ETF market. And their ETFs trade a ton. I'd say maybe half the investors who use ETFs are trading. They're tweaking. They're moving their portfolios. Maybe the other half is a little more in the van guardian front like a dan egan from betterment who they don't trade hardly at all although we'll have dan on they'll make little shifts or every year they make a shift but then there's people who tune into bloomberg tv who might be living in florida and just looking to do some day trading and they they need to hear from dad you like my dad (laughs) do all day traders live in florida is that the idea (laughs) i was just trying to uh, create a little bit of a uh, stereotype maybe but yeah i think a lot of them do I think a lot of people down there have money and they're a little bit like have time on their hands. Or Phoenix. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I'm actually sunny, going. Sunny climates. Yes. Um, but I'm just thinking of like there's professionals who need to know what to do because that's their job. And then there's also just individual retail investors who are just want to be aware. And then a lot of times in the show, we'll go from Jeff Sherman talking about macro to talking about ETFs that he offers and why they might be a solution to that or even other people's ETFs. We'll ask him about HYG. So we will pepper in ETFs to the macro. So because I always thought ETFs are how you play at home to everything being said on Bloomberg TV. Sure. They're, they democratize everything. You can do any trade. And uh, they can be good for retail investors. They can be good for institutional investors. I love talking about bond blocks, you know, because that is like uh, deep in the weeds, nitty gritty ETF tools that you can use in a much larger trading strategy. Yeah, no, absolutely. But no bigger topic right now for an investor like this than than the Fed and how the Fed's doing their job. I, I was, the, the Fed's always the biggest topic. I mean, even if like... I think we not always. ourselves for a while. For a while, I'm, I'm not so sure it was, but like it now it is. It definitely wasn't. Dude, yeah. they were at ZERP for 10 years. Um, zero interest rate policy or NERP, near zero interest rate policy, right? So for a long time, earnings really mattered. People yeah. cared how companies did in the stock market. You know, for a long time, um, it was about the economy. 
That said, sometimes it'd be like you'd have like a good earnings run and then someone would go like, wait a second, the Fed could raise rates and actually you'd have a sell off. There has been this interesting good news, bad news, bad news, good news, back and forth. Sometimes they line up. Good news is good news. But then sometimes good news is bad news. And it's usually because the Fed's reaction is going to create a sell off, even though that you had just had good news. It's just it's just the Fed is a huge force. It comes up a lot and as it should be. Matt. Katie, thanks for joining us on Trillions and and congrats on ETF IQ. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weppershow. He's at Eric Balchunas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Bye. 